two shows every day. It's a lot of editing. So. Your show is amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I've met the best people. I'll tell you, I never would have met half the people I'm meeting if I had to keep doing my job, which was traveling. So this has been wonderful. So thank you <laughs> so much. I cannot wait. It's going to start any second. And hello, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today, my guest is going to talk about how to fight autoimmune disease. And he is not only a rheumatologist, but he is a plant-based rheumatologist and he's an integrated rheumatologist. So we're going to find out a little bit more about what that means. His lovely wife, Dr. Mandala, has been on the show already. And if you haven't seen that episode, I can link to it below in the show notes. But please welcome today, Dr. Micah Yu. It's so great to see you again. Oh, thank you so much, Chef AJ. You know, I love your show and I think what you're doing is so great for the community, bring all these plant-based people together with healthcare professionals or people in the healthcare field. Um, it's just amazing and chefs and all over the world. So I really love your show and I'm so honored to be on your show. I appreciate that. And I didn't start out really with a with a goal like that. The goal was really just to create a sense of community during the pandemic. And then when hundreds of people were like, can I be on? I'm like, of course. And you know, the, the one bright spot about the pandemic is there's some people that are just not doing anything right now that would never be on the show, but because they they're chomping at the bit to like speak, I've been getting some, you know, just wonderful guests. And, and I, as I was saying, like, I, yes, we met once at the fasting escape, but mm -hmm. a lot of people I would not have met if, if I continued my life, just going from city to city, just like yesterday's guests. And so what were you doing at the fasting escape, checking it out to see if it yeah. was right for your patients? Yeah, so me and my wife, Dr. Mandala, we, we believe in fasting and we got connected to Nathan at the Fasting Escape. So uh, we were there just to see what it was all about um, and how the program worked. And luckily we ran into you there as well. I'm so glad we got to reconnect uh, after a year. Yeah. Well, you don't like, like your wife, you, neither of you look old enough to be a doctor, but that is I so know. cool. That, <laughs> I mean, I just love it that you guys are like this plant-based power couple now. Yeah, thank you so much. I And I think people like you really helped um, us doctors, like, you know, to get to know about this, to really understand how plant-based really helps the body. And you're a living example of that. Yeah. And I love that you're in a field that is not, I, I don't want to say inundated, because there's really no field that's inundated by plant-based doctors. But, you know, lots of them seem to turn to cardiology, which makes sense, because cardiology is, is it, it's pretty easy to prevent and reverse if you do it right. Yeah. But rheumatology, I don't know if there's a lot of plant-based rheumatologists out there. I, I'm the only one that I know of in the whole nation. Um, I mean, I, you know, Dr. Laurie Marbas and all these other doctors, plant -based, I asked them who are the other plant-based rheumatologists. There's no one else out yeah. there that I know so, of. So, so ologist means study of what, what I, I think I kind of know what you do, but what is a rheumato rheumatologist? Because yeah, what, so, what does R-H-E-U-M even mean? Yeah. So um, I'll be talking about that in my PowerPoint, but I can talk about briefly here. So uh, the field of rheumatology, you need to do three years of internal medicine residency to start. And then you do two years, two or three years of uh, specialty training after that. And the field of rheumatology is a study of autoimmune diseases uh, con that are related to connective tissue. So either muscle, bone, joints, or even some vessels as well. And it's also the study of arthritis also. So osteoarthritis, osteoporosis is one is one of our specialty. Gout, uh, you've probably heard of gout as well. That's in our, one of our diseases also. So a lot of wow. autoimmune diseases. Wow, well, how did you get into, I always, I always wonder, because both my brothers are doctors, all of my cousins, almost all of my nieces and nephews. And I always wonder what makes you like decide to choose your specialty. Did you mm -hmm. know going into medical school or like why, why rheumatology? Because I, I myself have a rheumatic disease. So I'll be talking about that also. I have autoimmune disease also. So I'm, and I use plant-based nutrition to really help myself overcome my disease. So um, I'm, a, I'm a patient also. So I understand how important plant-based nutrition is. And it's so scientifically sound as well. That's great because then you probably have, you, you really can empathize with the patient. Like I always felt that that um, that men should not be gynecologists because they have no idea what's going on down there with us, but yeah. you can actually have, empathize with your patients. So when they say it hurts, like, I know, I know what you mean. It really no, does I, hurt. Yeah. I, I say that every visit when patients says, I hurt. I'm like, well, how does it hurt? Because for me, the pain is like an achy pain. Is it an achy pain for you? So that's how we connect. And it's so much easier to understand what a patient goes through. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned arthritis and I'm, I'm in the midst of hosting or not. Well, I'm, I'm doing the interviews for the Truth About Weight Loss Summit, which that's why this screen is up instead of the usual Chef AJ screen, which starts airing free next month. And I just interviewed Dr. Stefan Essert, who is a sports medicine doctor. And what he said yesterday in his interview is something I never heard. And I'm wondering if you heard that he said, because we were talking about the ramifications of having excess weight with all kinds of diseases, and particularly because he sees a lot of joint disease. And he was saying that that 
you even people that are overweight can get arthritis in their hands, even though their hands are not, you know, the weight bearing part of the body. And I thought, wow, that is, that's, un, I've never heard that before. Yeah, I, I see arthritis in very skinny people, overweight people. It doesn't matter what size you are, you can get arthritis. Um, and autoimmune disease starts at a very young age. I've seen autoimmune disease at three years old, two years old, and it go up to like your 80s and 90s. But osteoarthritis is not an autoimmune disease. It's uh, more of the wear and tear on the joints, and that can happen on the hands also. Yeah, interesting. Well, one of your patients is watching. Nan says, Dr. Yu is my plant-based rheumatologist who told me that I don't need them because I'm no longer symptomatic because of my whole food plant-based nutritional plan. He is oh. terrific. So people can, if I, if I understand correctly, you work at the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. So you, we I, could... I, I, I used to work at the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. I, okay. I opened my own clinic with my wife uh, called Dr. Lifestyle Clinic in Newport Beach. Okay. Well, the reason I ask is, can you still do telemedicine? Because I know that... Yeah. that Okay. That's, that's yeah. what I was getting at. I apologize for not re oh. realizing you switched, but that's great because there are people probably watching that have autoimmune disease that would like a plant-based rheumatologist. And it seems like you're the only one. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've seen, I've been seeing patients all over the U S I have like 16 state licenses. Um, so they can message me or go on my website afterwards. And I've also seen patients internationally. I'm seeing someone from Canada. I saw someone from Peru, um, last month as well. Nice. Great. Yeah. Well, whenever you're ready, I know you've prevented, uh, uh, prevented, you've presented, uh, <laughs> you're preventing us from, you have a, I can't speak, it's Sunday, but you have a PowerPoint presentation. And if there's time, maybe you could take some questions that are appearing in the chat. Oh, of course. Yeah. So my PowerPoint is kind of long, but I'm going to keep this succinct as much as possible. Well, it's Sunday, so we have extra time because I don't awesome. have an, I don't have another show today. So you take as much time as you need because this is a subject that we just haven't really delved into yet because we haven't been able to find a plant based yeah. rheumatologist or and an integrative felt... one. And that's interesting too because you know I've had there are people that are integrative physicians but they're not plant based and they're plant based exactly. but they're not integrative. You're like you're both. Yeah, I'm trying to do it all. Um, so I spent a lot of time on this uh, PowerPoint because I love your show and I I want to give my best to your audience. So. I'm going to, there's about 86 slides, but we're going to zoom through some of them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just if you could just do it in, in a, a slide mode, because I'm seeing this one. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So the title of this talk is Fighting Autoimmune Disease with an Integrative Rheumatologist. Uh, so I'm Dr. Micah Yu. I'm uh, the co-founder of the Dr. Lifestyle Clinic in Newport Beach. And you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter uh, at my Autoimmune MD. So about me, I got my Bachelor of Science in Business Administration at UC Riverside, and then I got my Doctor of Medicine at Chicago Medical School. I then went to Loma Linda University uh, for my Internal Medicine Residency and Rheumatology Fellowship. Um, I'm double board certified in Internal Medicine and Lifestyle Medicine through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and I'm also in my second fellowship now at the Integrated Medicine Fellowship at the University of Arizona. So I'm going to talk about my childhood and how I got to where I am today as a plant-based rheumatologist. So as you see here, this is back in uh, elementary school. I was probably eight years old at the time, six, I think. But I'm the one in the middle. I'm the chubbiest one in the group here. Um, I was eating a standard American diet. My mom was right behind me. I ate chicken nuggets, anything you get from Costco, the frozen food, you name it. Um, so nothing really plant-based <laughs> and maybe some Chinese veggies. And then high school went on. I was still overweight. Um, I played football. I was probably 160. I was a, a defensive lineman. Uh, it's the basically the players in the middle of the pack uh, where the, all the action is. So I was um, I was trying to get strong at the time. I was trying to lose weight after football. So I went on a high protein diet. I went on the Atkins diet. Okay. So I ate a lot of dairy, a lot of protein powder, a lot of steak, a lot of chicken and fish. And what happened? I ended up getting gout. So gout is a rheumatic disease. Gout is a disease of inflammation and of high uric acid levels as well. You can get gout if you have normal uric acid also. However, this disease was known as the disease of kings because what did kings do back then? They ate a very, very um, rich diet full of seafood, full of meat back then. So I believe King Henry VIII had gout, Nostradamus, the uh, the prophet also had gout. Uh, Benjamin Franklin had gout as well. And you can die from gout because gout not only affects the joints, but it can affect the kidneys, your um, arteries also if it's uncontrolled. But luckily we have medications these days that can help with that. So I was weighing about 160 pounds. I went down to 130 pounds on a um, Atkins diet, but I got gout 
and I was eating about 200 grams of protein. That is not normal. So I ended up getting this arthritis um, diagnosed by my father, who was a family medicine doctor. And then as the years went on, you know, my joint pains really transformed into something else that cannot be explained. Um, this is a picture in 2013 when I was in medical school. As you can see here, my left foot, the top of my foot was inflamed. I would get flares every month. So gout usually attacks me one joint or two joints. I started getting pain all over my body and my TMJ, where my jaw is, I got it in my fingers, my wrists, my toes, my knees, you name it, I got it. I got swollen joints that are red. Sometimes I couldn't even eat for a week, two weeks, three weeks because my jaw was so inflamed that I couldn't really open my mouth. I went to different doctors, even different rheumatologists. They could not explain what was going on because uh, all my autoimmune labs were negative, but my inflammatory markers were positive. So they said, you have gout, but you have something else going on that we cannot explain. Luckily, when I got to residency, I went to the rheumatology division at Loma Linda University. And my bosses, who, who came at bosses later on, um, they were able to diagnose something called spondyloarthritis. This is a disease. Um, so if you have uh, ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis, you have something called spondyloarthritis. I have a subset called peripheral spondyloarthritis. So I did not get the back pain that you typically get in ankylosing spondylitis, but I had pain everywhere else, you, shoulders, wrists, knees, elbows, you name it, and I got it. And I did get the tendon pain as well, which I'll go into. So this is an autoimmune disease. So I had two diagnoses, actually three, because they did get fluid from my ankle um, at one point, and I was diagnosed pseudogout, which is not gout. It's another crystal that they find in the microscope. Um, so I have three diagnoses, actually. So I said, you know what? Enough was enough. I was introduced to plant-based nutrition by my wife. She was... Um, doing the lifestyle medicine um, certificate and fellowship at the time uh, during my third year of residency. And she, during Thanksgiving, she'd cook a plant-based meal for me. And I was like, this is not tasty. I'm not used to this. So this was back in November of 2017 when I was first introduced to plant-based meals. As you can see here, I was very overweight um, from 2009. And then now 2019, I lost a lot of weight. I dropped from 155 pounds, 160 pounds to I'm um, now 130. I was as low as 125. So I was overweight at the time. So after being introduced to my first plant-based meal, it took many months for me to actually try it consistently. Uh, I went to Guam for a medical rotation in April of 2018. And in May of 2018, I watched Forks Over Knives and I um, read Michael Greger's um, How Not to Die. And I we looked at his website, nutritionfacts.org, and I studied it. And I said, you know what? Let's give this a shot. Let's see if my pain does go away. So my pain within three months went away completely. My C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker on labs, went negative after 10 years. My other lab was still positive, but half what it was before. So my pain, I mean, went away completely. I could not believe it. It was like magic. I was offered medications by other doctors uh, for my spinal arthritis. I never took it. And up to today, I still don't need it. Um, I do take medications for gout every now and then, um, but that's all I need. So that's when I was inspired to create my social media, my autoimmune MD, because I want the world to know that there's something better out there that you can do other than medications. So I'm on Instagram and on Facebook uh, to spread the word of plant-based nutrition and the importance of lifestyle medicine to fight autoimmune disease. And then we went on to create the Dr. Lifestyle Clinic with me and my wife, uh, where she specializes in primary care and lifestyle medicine. And I specialize in rheumatology, lifestyle medicine, and integrated medicine. So we are a duo here in the clinic, um, trying to offer uh, the world a message of healing. So what is rheumatology? I know Chef AJ, you asked me um, just a couple minutes ago on what rheumatology is. So just to give your audience, if they're just coming on now, rheumatology is uh, the field of diagnosing and treating musculoskeletal disease and systemic autoimmune conditions, commonly referred to as rheumatic diseases. Sometimes we're known as detectives of medicine and also immunologists of medicine as well. So if you've watched House MD, I would say at least 
two of the diseases every season was related to rheumatic diseases because our diseases are rare and they're fascinating. And um, sometimes patients go from specialist to specialist, never knowing um, what disease they have until they come to the rheumatologist because our diseases are puzzles and come that can affect every system of the body. So what are the diseases of rheumatology? So this is just a few of the diseases that we treat. Um, so very common ones that you've probably heard of are rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, gout, pseudogout, lupus, uh, psoriatic arthritis, and colitis spondylitis, but we get to some pretty rare diseases here, vasculitis, um, sarcoidosis, adult onset steel disease, auto-inflammatory conditions. Fibromyalgia is not an autoimmune disease, but it's a disease of widespread pain and sometimes brain fog that rheumatologists treat and osteoporosis, um, which you've probably heard of as well, bone thinning, that's one of our diseases as well. So I'm gonna go through some diseases and just go over some of the symptoms and signs of it. So I try not to put too many graphic uh, images on here because our disease can be pretty graphic. So this is pretty much an end stage rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is uh, an autoimmune disease and it can affect patients as young as two, three, one years old. But when it's that young, it's called juvenile idiopathic arthritis or juvenile rheumatic arthritis. But when they turn 18, it becomes rheumatoid arthritis. They change the wording of it. And the signs are morning stiffness, joint pains. Um, you can get um, positive lab markers. Your joints, um, you can get something called erosions where you start getting holes in your bones because the inflammation starts eating away at the bones. The hands are a typical spot for it to affect, but it can affect any other joint in the body. And you can get problems that affect out, um, symptoms outside of the joints. So I've seen patients that affect the lungs only. So they come into the hospital and they're in the ICU because they can't breathe. And that was a very, that's one thing that um, I remember very closely um, is a patient that came in that had rheumatoid arthritis um, on labs, but never had any joint symptoms and had trouble breathing. Um, it can also affect your brain, your skin, your heart as well. So there's extra articular manifestations. Lupus is another disease you've probably heard of. Very, very um, complicated disease as well. On the left is a picture of a patient with something called a butterfly rash, which is a very um, typical sign of lupus. Um, you don't have to have this sign, of course, but there's other lupus signs as well. So you can have hair loss, you can have mouth sores, you can have body rashes, you can have a face rash, joint pain, chest pain. Um, you can get kidney involvement as well. Um, brain involvement. So lupus is a disease that can affect every single organ of the body and it can affect your blood cells as well. Um, so you can get anemia, you can have low white blood cell count as well because your antibodies are killing off the blood cells. So this is another autoimmune disease that I treat. Gout. Um, I mentioned that gout. Um, so this is end stage gout here. So there's something called uric acid that we naturally produce in the body. But when you eat um, red meat, seafood, it can elevate your uric acid levels. And when you don't control your gout, you can get uric acid deposits that become something called tophus, which is a chalky um, sediment that it can build up in your joints. So I've seen patients with this are much severe than this that are wheelchair bound in the 20s and the 30s because they don't take my medications. Um, they don't see their doctor. So this is what happens. Um, and luckily we do have medications that can actually shrink these chalk chalky deposits. Um, it's an IV infusion. And I don't think food can reverse this. Um, it'll take a very, very long time, probably many, many years, if it's even possible. Um, no literature shows that food can reverse this, but medications can. Ankylosing spondylitis is an autoimmune disease attack of the lower back and the pelvic bones. This is a healthy spine on your left here. When you have ankylosing spondylitis, your bones start to fuse in the spine. And ankylosing spondylitis signs are, um, you can get, so this happens um, a lot in 20 year olds, 30 year olds, and even in the teens. And typically patients wake up in the middle of the night from back pain, they wake up with back pain stiffness, and they get undiagnosed for many years because they go around from doctor to doctor. Doctors think that, oh, you're so young, um, this is not an issue, or you probably just pull the muscle, or you just have some back um, spine issues but they don't think of autoimmune disease. And so I've seen patients that come to me after being undiagnosed for five years, 10 years, and they finally come to me. And sometimes 
um, they, I've seen patients that are wheelchair bound from this disease, or they're so hunched over because their spine is fused. It's called a bamboo spine when this happens. Um, so this is another very typical disease that I see as well. Myositis. Um, I don't know if you heard of this, Jeff, AJ, but uh, myositis, there's two term, there's a couple variations of this. Dermatomyositis, polymyositis are um, typical autoimmune diseases of myositis. Typically, these patients come to my clinic, they have trouble um, raising their arms up, they have trouble walking because their um, autoimmune disease is attacking their muscles. Um, it's eating away their muscles, their muscles are breaking down. Um, and you can also get rashes, trouble breathing, you can have difficulty swallowing as well. Um, it could be very mild where the patient is walking to my clinic saying, I have muscle weakness um, and that's pretty much it, or I have a little rash here. But I've seen patients in the ICU, they don't get diagnosed until they're in the hospital and they're intubated in the ICU with a tube down the throat. Um, they have full-blown myositis going on and we have to give our strongest medications just to get them out of the hospital. Um, and there's other variations of this. Necrotizing myositis is another autoimmune disease that um, many people have not heard of. Um, you can get it from statin use. So your cholesterol lowering medications can cause necrotizing myositis where you have a breakdown of the muscle. However, that's very rare, but I have seen it in my clinic. So that's a side effect of um, cholesterol lowering medications such as statin. Psoriatic arthritis is another arthritis medication. That's another autoimmune disease. And you can see it with psoriasis, um, which is an autoimmune disease of the skin. So they can be linked. You don't have to have psoriasis to have psoriatic arthritis, but this is just another sign, another arthritis out there. So typically you see pit, pitting nails in these patients. Um, they have, might have a psoriasis rash, morning stiffness, and they can have the tendon pain as well, called enthesitis. Enthesitis is the connection. So emphesis is a connection between your bone and your tendon or your ligament. And the point of the connection that's inflamed is called enthesitis. So it's a very small point that's inflamed. So that's another sign of this. Shogun's is a very typical autoimmune disease as well. You typically get dry eyes, dry mouth because this autoimmune disease attacks the salivary glands um, and other mucosal glands as well. And you can get rashes, you can get joint pain, you get lung involvement with this disease as well. Vasculitis is a very rare disease that I saw a lot at Loma Linda University during my training. Um, and different pockets of America have more, um, some, that, some doctors see more of this than others. Um, but these are just names of the different autoimmune diseases of vasculitis. Vasculitis is literally the inflammation of vessels. And every single vessel in your body can be inflamed, whether it's small, medium, or large. And these are all the different kinds of symptoms that you can see. So sometimes I have patients coming in into the hospital or in my clinic coughing up blood, or they have chronic sinus issues. And sometimes these are just early signs of their vasculitis. It can affect the kidney. You can die from these, um, from vasculitis. I've seen death from vasculitis before. So all these autoimmune diseases can be very serious. Um, I've seen patients die from them. Every single one of them. I've seen someone die from rheumatoid arthritis. Of course, they weren't on medications. They didn't want to see doctors. So that's what happened. They were not eating a plant-based diet or anti-inflammatory diet. Okay. Um, but if you take care of your body, your health, um, and you, and if you need to, you take medications, you can control these diseases. One in five Americans have an autoimmune disease. That's why bringing up this topic is so important. That's 20%. And this is from the American Autoimmune Related Disease Association. This is a president. She said that the rapid increase in autoimmune disease is clearly suggested that environmental factors are at play due to the significant increase in these diseases. Genes do not change in such a short period of time. You know, our genes in the past 120, 200 years, I don't think they've changed that much, but our environment has. The industrial revolution, refined food, processed food, all these have played a role. So let's see how many people in the world have these disease. American College of Rheumatology says 1.3 million Americans have rheumatoid arthritis, about 0.62.4 has spinal arthritis, which I am one of them. Lupus, about 300,000 people. Um, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma, which is a thickening of the skin. Um, that's what one of the symptoms of 50,000 people. Giant cell arteritis, which is a vasculitis, is about 200,000 people, which affects usually people over the age of 50. Autoimmune diseases 
on the rise across all boards, all across all different specialties. And it's going about 7% a year if you look at the average. And I give medications called biologics to my patients. And these, patients, and these uh, medications can get side effects such as cancer, which however, the side effect of that is very low, but it does give you more infections um, and you can't do certain things when you're on these medications. And these medications can cost up to $20,000 on average. So they're very expensive. These are medications you see on the commercials all the time. They're, sometimes they're injectables and they, it's like insulin. You inject it in your belly, you inject it on your thigh just to calm the immune system down. Because in autoimmune disease, your immune system is overactive. So what we're trying to do is calm down the immune system in the body. But sometimes when we're doing that, we're calming parts of, uh, parts of the immune system are down that are necessary to fight infections. So that's why you can get more infections with these um, medications. So our autoimmune disease is part genetics and part environment. That's why your show is so important, Chef AJ, because you talk about plant-based nutrition and the importance of diet. And diet is one key role to calm down inflammation and help prevent autoimmune disease. So why is integrative rheumatology or integrative medicine so important to rheumatology? And this includes lifestyle medicine. I, I clump it together. So the reason why it's so important because not only are genetics at play, but diet is involved, your sleep, your stress, your exercise, are you using drugs, do you smoke tobacco, your environmental toxins? How about previous infections and also trauma? Did you have abuse growing up? Did you have bullying when you were in high school or in middle school? And um, stress levels, I can't emphasize stress enough. I've had patients that went through a divorce, a parent died, a family member died, and they come to me flaring, or that's one of the, that's one of the things that preceded their onset of their autoimmune disease. So I ask all these questions in my clinic, and that's something that a lot of rheumatologists and doctors don't have time to ask their patients, or they don't know to ask their patients those questions because they don't look in the literature and they don't have that extra training of lifestyle medicine and also integrated medicine as well. So the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is a new field that was developed in 2004 at Loma Linda University. And I am one of the lifestyle medicine um, board certified doctors out there. And it is so important um, to medicine now. And I'm very happy that it's now going into different medical curriculum. And at Loma Linda University, um, they do have a lifestyle medicine fellowship, which my wife went through. And there's six pillars here that are so important. Healthy eating, centered around whole food plant-based nutrition, increased physical activity, managing stress, forming healthy relationships, improving your sleep and avoiding risky substances. And this is a foundation to the blue zones, which are cities in the world where people live the longest. And Loma Linda is one of those cities. And this is a foundation to my practice as well. And if you study um, integrated medicine or even functional medicine, lifestyle medicine is the foundation to each of these. So lifestyle medicine is not new. So in the field of integrated medicine has been talking about lifestyle medicine for many years before the field of lifestyle medicine there was integrated medicine that was um andrew weil was the uh grandfather of um lifestyle medicine but they don't they didn't talk about whole food plant-based nutrition necessarily but they talked about the importance of fruits and vegetables and uh, how trending towards that was really important and that's how lifestyle met the field of lifestyle medicine um is a little bit different american culture lifestyle because we talk about whole food plant-based diet but overall this is a core foundation, no matter what kind of integrative field you go into. So let's go to the meat of our talk today. So we're going to talk about nutrition mainly in this uh, PowerPoint because there's so much to talk about and I can't go, go through everything. It'll take many hours. So let's go over what about nutrition. You always talk about the Chef AJ, a whole food pepe style. Why is it so important? Because the phytonutrients eat the rainbow. We always talk about that in lifestyle medicine, okay? Each color has a different phytonutrient. Final nutrients are little micronutrients in these fruits and vegetables and beans that can have really good benefits for our body. But everyone's always asking, what should I eat? There's so many autoimmune disease diets out there. Some people say they get better on autoimmune protocol diet, carnivore diet, which we're not happy with, keto diet, vegan diet, Mediterranean diet, whole food plant-based pescatarian, vegetarian diet. So what should we really be eating for an autoimmune disease diet? 
So one of my favorite anti-inflammatory um, phytonutrients and vegetables is turmeric. Turmeric is a vegetable, it's a herb that we use. Indians love to use it in the Asian population. You probably use this as well, Chef AJ. Um, I love it. It's very anti-inflammatory. We see it used in many different things, band-aids, ice cream, um, coffee, lattes, even books. I don't know how effective those are, but they're, they're being sold. They're even using it for dodging. Buy this on Amazon for a nice price of $25. And I was studying um, turmeric on lupus at Loma University. Um, however, it cut my study short um, because of COVID-19. But there are two studies in the world on turmeric and lupus. I ran Indonesia. Um, the studies were not, I don't think they made a profound effect because um, some of this show that it helped a little bit, but it wasn't that impactful. There's over 6,000 studies on turmeric and curfew in, in the literature. And if you combine it with black pepper, which is piperine, you increase the absorption by over 2000%. That's why it's so important to include black pepper when you're cooking with turmeric. And when you're taking the supplement, it's important to look at the label in the back to make sure there's black pepper or else you're just peeing it out. And there's an anti-inflammatory mechanism on curcumin. Um, so there's something called T-regulatory cells, which is your anti-inflammatory T cells. So you have T cells and B cells in your body T regulatory cells are your anti inflammatory T cells. So I love T regulatory cells, okay? These are your psychologists of your immune system. So when you're fighting an infection, whether it's a virus or a bacterial infection, the T regulatory cells tell your body, look, we're done fighting this infection. You don't need to fight anymore. So your T regulatory cells say, let's calm down, we're done. In autoimmune disease, what it does is it tells your body, look, this is a cell of our body. This is our friend. Do not attack it. However, in autoimmune disease, we know that T regulatory cells are down. So when they're down, your body has a more difficult time of um, avoiding your um, making peace with their own body cells. So it starts attacking itself and creating autoimmune disease. So there's an anti-inflammatory effect of um, curcumin. Um, so curcumin is the final nutrient of turmeric. So these, the three things I'm highlighting here are medications and rheumatology that we fight against. So TNF, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1, they're called cytokines. Cytokines are cell-to-cell um, -cell communication signals that we have in our body that, um, that can incite inflammation. So we have medications that attack these inflammatory cytokines or inflammatory signals. And curcumin in literature has been able to fight all these diseases, not even autoimmune disease, but cardiovascular cancer, neurologic disease, so these are all just examples of what curcumin has done, whether it be on the lab level or in animals or humans. Another phytonutrient that has been proven to be anti-inflammatory is resveratrol, which is found in grapes. So if you love wine, this is one of the reasons why wine, they say it can be beneficial because of resveratrol. Resveratrol has been shown to fight many different diseases, not only autoimmune disease, but um, metabolic disease, cardiovascular, cancer, as well as infectious disease. Um, so whether it be animal studies or human studies, there is some proof out there in literature. Resveratrol has also been able to show that it can fight um, and help with the joints as well. It has an anti-inflammatory effect. That's why I love grapes. I recommend it to all my patients. Eat the rainbow and also eat your grapes. So let's talk about fiber. I know you love fiber, Chef AJ. I love fiber. All the plant-based people love fiber, and it's so important. The USDA recommends that we eat 25 grams of fiber for a woman and 38 grams for men. But this is the minimum. Only 5% of Americans are meeting this goal. And why is fiber so important? Fiber is important because um, studies have shown the more fiber you eat, the lower your metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is high cholesterol, um, high blood pressure and diabetes. So you can lower that risk of that. You can lower your inflammation levels and you can also lower your chances of getting obesity. So this is from the NHANES survey uh, from 1999 to 2010 from the American Journal of Medicine. Fiber has also been done in studies in arthritis. So in our rheumatology journals as well. So the study showed that the higher dietary fiber intake you have, the lower uh, the risk or relation of knee pain in osteoarthritis patients. So this is, I don't think this is an autoimmune disease patients, but 
osteoarthritis. So remember, osteoarthritis is wear and tear of your joints. And this can happen whether you're older. Um, this typically happens in more older individuals, but you can see it in younger individuals if they've gone, gone through trauma, whether it be car accidents, extreme sports like football, or if they were in the military. So military, I, I worked at the VA for two years or five years actually. And I saw a lot of knee pain in these patients because they jumped out of helicopters. Um, there was a lot of trauma involved and they were typically very young, 20, 30 year olds that were coming to my clinic for this. And osteoarthritis, I also want to mention, even though it's not an autoimmune disease, studies have shown that there is inflammation at the area of the joint. So you don't have to have autoimmune disease to have inflammation. Um, so this is new data that's coming out in the past couple of years. Let's talk about omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So we're, we're about to get to the inflammatory part of our talk, but we were talking about the anti-inflammatory part earlier. So omega-3 fatty acids are so important for inflammation. Um, and there's a balance in your body. There's always omega-3 fatty acids are always fighting your omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-6 fatty acids are pro-inflammatory. Now let's look at the pathway here. What is pro-inflammatory? So when you eat a Western diet, your standard American diet is very pro-inflammatory. It has a lot of omega-6 fatty acids, your fast food, um, your refined oils, your uh, French fries, because it has oil. It's not the potatoes that's the issue. It's the oils. Um, it's you're frying it, your red meat, uh, your chicken. Um, so all these things, your chips, your cookies, all these different things are omega-6 fatty acids, okay? Your omega-3 fatty acids are your plant-based foods, your Mediterranean diet. Um, so them, they say that fish, in all the studies, fish has an anti-inflammatory. But what's wrong with fish? It's very, it has a lot of toxins in it. Oil spills. Um, give it the toxic PCBs um, from the environment going to the fish. So that's why fish, if you can, avoid it because it can be detrimental. Some people can tolerate, some people can't because it's a, it can be a very dirty seafood. But plant-based foods are very anti-inflammatory. So your chia seeds, your flax seeds are anti-inflammatory. That's what the studies show. And wh what is happening when you eat omega-3 fatty acids? You are producing resolvents and protectants. These are your signals that are active when you're going, getting over joint pain, you're going over inflammation. This is what is resolving your inflammation. That's why it's called resolvent and protectant. And um, your plant-based foods or, or your vegan, your algae-based omega-3 supplements will help you upregulate these things to help resolve your inflammation. That's why omega-3 fatty acids are important to help inflammation. So let's go on to the next part of pro-inflammatory foods. This food in our past lives was what we ate every day, okay? Um, hamburgers, uh, your french fries, your donuts, all this stuff that we ate in the past. Um, or some of us still eat, it's pro-inflammatory. Um, we try to avoid it. And salt is can be very pro-inflammatory as well. Um, so. Remember how I said T regulatory cells are anti-inflammatory? When we eat a high salt diet, you are decrease your T regulatory cells because your, your pro-inflammatory T cells, which is your T helper one and T helper 17 cells are increased because of salt. So I know Chef AJ loves the no salt, no oil, uh, no sugar, um, your, 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 that kind of diet, which I also advocate in my clinic. So this is why you don't want to eat that much salt because it can increase inflammation. And we do have the pathway for that. We talk about it for this one, the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, the, the title of this talk was Salty Taste to Autoimmunity. And New England Journal of Medicine is the premier journal for doctors. And here it shows all these different inflammatory signals or cytokines that are upregulated from salt that produces autoimmune disease. And why do I harp on this? Because look at this, all these things I'm highlighting here in red are our medications that decrease inflammation in, across different autoimmune disease. And these medications on average can cost up to $20,000 a year. So why would I be giving you these medications without talking about why salt is inflammatory and why you should minimize it? So I will be just doing you a disservice as a rheumatologist if I don't talk about all these pro-inflammatory foods 
um, and just giving you medications. And that's what typical doctors do these days because we don't have time and we don't have knowledge of this. So when I, I actually gave a grand rounds or um, a talk at my university when I was in training on something similar to this, I took parts of that slide into this. And a lot of doctors did not know about this, okay? Because as doctors, what, we, what studies do we look at? We look at the newest medications, uh, how to, what are the newest labs or the diagnoses to help our patients? We don't look at diet. And, and this is uh, lupus nephritis or lupus of the kidneys. It also shows that a high salt diet affected um, lupus of the kidneys as well. And let's go on to talk about advanced glycation end products, also known as age. Age is when your proteins or lipids um, or your fats become attached to sugars. That's what it is, okay? Why am I talking about this? Because it's inflammatory in excess, okay? This is from the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. When you have high age, it can activate something called NF-kappa beta, which is one of the little signals in your cells that sparks up inflammation. This is what you wanna block in your body. And what increases age? Uh, your diet, exercise. Um, yeah, so if you have poor diet, if you don't exercise, if you smoke, these all elevate age and then inflammation. So this is not aging as in age, this is more, it's called advanced glycation end products. And this is contributor to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and kidney disease as well, just not autoimmune disease. And what, why am I talking about this also? Because of food. Food affects advanced glycation end products as well. If you cook at a higher temperature, it increases your age. Remember like when you cook with oil, the higher the oil, every oil has a smoke point and that becomes carcinogenic when you cook over that smoke point. So another reason why you shouldn't cook at a higher temperature. When you cook with more moisture, it decreases the age. Meat has a highest age, okay? Highest end, uh, advanced glycation end products. Salmon has the lowest one out of all the meat products out there. Fried bacon is the worst. We always want to avoid bacon. Even if you're not plant-based, you want to avoid bacon. That's the worst thing you eat for yourself. Vegetables and fruits have the lowest one. Look at roasted potatoes, grilled vegetables, bananas, cooking beans, very, very low. French fries all the way up there, even though it's potatoes, has oil in it, you're frying it. That's why you wanna have air fried French fries, okay? Potatoes without oil, to season it with herbs or something. And then processed food and fats has the highest, uh, has high age as well, not as high as animal products, but you know, butter has the highest one out of all of them. Chips has is high as well. But this is general guideline here. It's not the end all be all, but you should take this into account when you're talking about nutrition science. And has age been studied in autoimmune disease and rheumatic disease? Yes, it has. This is very something surprising to my uh, doctors at my university as well when I was in training there. So they study advanced glycation end product in something called adult onset still disease, which is an autoimmune disease that affects, that gives you rashes, gives you fevers, and gives you joint pain. And also it's been studied in lupus as well. So they, they found that when the blood levels of the advanced glycation end products were high, and the patients had more active disease of lupus and adult onset still disease. When they had lower advanced glycation end products, the disease was less active. So that's the end of the anti-inflammatory foods and pro-inflammatory foods. There's much more to talk about, but that would take hours. So I'm, if you have any questions I can answer after this talk, um, let's go on to obesity. So obesity is a contributor to autoimmune disease as well. Your fat cells are just not sitting there when you're fat. They're hormonal cells. They increase your hormone levels. Um, they're active in the immune system. So you have your innate immune system and your adaptive immune system or your acquired immune system. Your innate immune system is your immune system that is on the go. It's ready to fight whatever disease or ready to fight whatever bacteria or viruses is invading your body. So I like to think of your immune system as your military, your body. That's why you need to take care of it. Your innate immune system is your army. It's in the front lines. It doesn't matter who the enemy is. It's, it's on the go. Your adaptive immune system, which is your T cells and B cells, they're the ones that are more selective. Your innate immune system 
um, turns on your adaptive immune system. So when you get vaccines or when you um, fight viruses again that you're countered for a second time, your, your B cells and your T cells are ready to go because they've seen it before. And when you're talking about antibodies, this is where B cells come in because there's different types of antibodies that you can create um, to when you do vaccines. And your fat cells affects both parts of the immune system and they can increase inflammation as well through these pathways. They're called adipokines. These are your fat cell hormones. And obesity has been studied in different autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, muscle sclerosis, type one diabetes, psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, and even thyroid disease. So that's why you need to decrease your weight. You need to eat a plant-based diet as much as possible. Even if you're a whole food plant-based, a plant predominant diet is key here. The one of the meats of the topic uh, of today is the gut microbiome. We cannot leave this talk without talking about the gut microbiome. And I'm sure Chef AJ, you've had many doctors and nutritionists talking about the gut microbiome on your show. Well, I'm gonna give you another viewpoint of this. So your gut microbiome is affected by nutrients, nutrition, um, and affection nutrient metabolism, drug metabolism, uh, your protection against viruses and bacteria, and also affects the immune system as well, immune modulation. And that's what we're gonna talk about today on the left side, nutrition, metabolism, and immune modulation. Why is the gut microbiome important? Because 60 to 70% of your immune system is located at the gut. Our gut has over hundred trillion bacteria there, not only on our skin, but in our intestines alone, there's 100 trillion. And what we're finding out nowadays over the past decade or two decades is that the gut microbiome does affect autoimmune disease. Almost every single autoimmune disease nowadays, we have literature coming out. But what do our doctors always talk about at our conferences? We talk about how there's something called gut dysbiosis, where the bad, bad gut bugs are outweighing your good gut bugs, but they're not talking about nutrition. They're talking about how can we use our medications to um, modulate the bacteria. And of course, we don't have the technology of that right now. We do have studies showing, oh, this bacteria is lower in this autoimmune disease, or this, um, this bacteria is higher in this autoimmune disease, but they're always talking about how does medicine affect it? We don't talk about nutrition. That's why today's talk is so important. What affects your gut microbiome? How you're born? Were you born vaginally or were you born by C-section? Because if you're born vaginally, you get your mother's flora. But if you're born by C-section, you're getting the hospital flora. Your diet, are you male or female? Your genetics is a very important role because your mother, your grandmother, your genes get passed down and it makes your microbiome as well. Have you had previous infections as well? Did you take a lot of antibiotics when you were younger? Are you stressed out all the time? Stress plays a role. Your sleep plays a role. How old are you? As you get older, um, you're, you're generating more inflammation, your microbiome changes. And because it affects your microbiome, it affects your autoimmune disease. It's all tied in. It's a cycle. So gut dysbiosis, like I mentioned earlier, is um, out of your gut microbiome out of balance. And that's been seen in lupus, ankylosis spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, vasculitis, and many other autoimmune diseases as well. This is just a sample. And it's been talked about in many prominent medical journals, Nature Review, um, American College of Rheumatology Journals, Arthritis, New England Journal of Medicine. This is not myth. This is not pseudoscience. This is actual in medical journals. And the basis of affecting your gut microbiome is through short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids affect your immune system. So what are they? They're fatty acids that are short chain. Okay, they're made up of 10 or less carbons. And what affects it, what helps it is fiber, dietary fiber. That's why plant-based diets are so powerful because we're always eating fiber. And fiber affects the bacteria at the gut in the best official way where it tells the bacteria to generate short chain fatty acids and short chain fatty acids generate anti-inflammatory signals. That's why plant-based diets can help prevent and potentially reverse autoimmune disease, okay? So it promotes T regulatory cells, which I mentioned earlier is an anti-inflammatory T cells and inhibits NF-kappa beta, 
which is the signal in your cells that generates inflammation. So that's why short-chain fatty acids are so important. That's why fiber is so important. And it's the same theme here, plant-based diets, plant-based diets, plant-based diets. And short-chain fatty acids not only affect the immune system, they affect the lung, they affect the brain, the liver, pancreas. And I know Chef AJ, you had doctors from all different fields on your show, whether it be the Schur's eyes on the brain or um, uh, Vanette, Dr. Vanessa Mendez on the gut, Dr. Will B, um, matching diabetes, talking about diabetes. We're all talking about the same theme here. Fiber, short chain fatty acids, gut microbiome affects everything. The gut brain connection, the gut joint connection, the gut lung connection. These are all things that people, doctors know about, um, at least doctors that are studying nutrition um, and are plant-based, they know about these things. And your diet affects the T cell balance at the gut. So diet affects your gut microbiome, which we've talked about in the past previous slides, and then affects your T cells. So when you um, eat a poor diet, it starts lowering or blocking your T regulatory cells, okay? Your anti-inflammatory T cells. And then it upregulates your inflammatory T cells, your T helper 17 cells. And it upregulates your inflammatory cytokines, the cell cell signals, your inflammatory ones. And you look at 17, just an example. And then it creates autoimmune disease, okay? And autoimmune disease just doesn't happen overnight. Autoimmune disease takes years to develop. And that's why you see patients going from doctor to doctor because they have science, early symptoms and your doctors ignore it. And then it becomes serious. Then you start shopping around for doctors and your doctors send you to specialist to specialist and you never get an answer until five years down the road. And studies have shown that lab markers are elevated in lupus 10 years prior to the diagnosis, even in rheumatoid arthritis. And what does gut dysbiosis cause? It causes a leaky gut or in medical terms, increased intestinal permeability. So when your gut's inflamed, you have autoimmune disease or your gut's out of balance, you have leaky gut and it affects your immune system at the gut. This is what this picture is showing. And let's take a wider view here. This is the gut here. Your gut immune system is right here. Pyrus patches also, which is also um, can be called the galt as well. And this is um, your circulation and your lymph system as well. So when you eat, um, an anti, uh, you're a pro-inflammatory diet, you take antibiotics, you have infections, you're very unhealthy. Um, it can cause um, inflammation and those inflammatory signals cause a leaky gut. Leaky gut goes into the immune system, goes to your circulation, and then talks to all the other um, immune cells at your lymph nodes through the circulation as well. So this is what this picture is showing. Also, this is a very busy slide but this is the basis of this picture. Not only is the gut important, so, but so is your oral flora, your oral microbiome. So studies have shown, and this is something that's well known amongst all rheumatologists, that when you have something called periodontitis or inflammation of your mouth, you generate some, a bug called P. gingivalis. P. gingivalis generates a enzyme called PAD uh, or peripheral uh, adenosine deaminase. I think I'm saying that correctly. It's a long word. And when this is upregulated, this enzyme is upregulated, you start generating antibodies in that, that affect rheumatoid arthritis. So that's why I always look at the mouth in my patients because I wanna make sure the mouth is doing okay. Because if your mouth is sick, and has a lot of issues, like a lot of cavities, you are at risk of getting rheumatoid arthritis, especially if you have a genetic component to it as well. And if you smoke, you also generate um, this PAD enzyme as well, which contributes to rheumatoid arthritis. I, I always ask the patients, are you smoking or have you smoked in the past? Because if you smoked in the past, you also are at risk of rheumatoid arthritis. So smoking is a big risk factor that can cause rheumatoid arthritis. So not only does smoking cause lung cancer, but it can cause a lot of autoimmune disease as well. And rheumatoid arthritis is a major example of that. Epigenetics, we're still on the microbiome here. So epigenetics is your genes are not fixed. Your genes can turn off and turn off based on your lifestyle. 
Sure. If you're eating a plant-based diet, you're turning on a lot of genes that can potentially give you diseases. If you're eating right, if you're exercising, if you're stressing less, if you have healthy relationships, um, if you um, did not take a lot of antibiotics in the past, you're, you're turning off the epigenetics um, that can help you. Okay. So there's something called histone deacetylase. So when you decrease your histone deacetylase, you're decreasing inflammation. This is what it's showing here. When you're increasing this histone deacetylase, you're increasing inflammation. So we're able to turn off certain things in our genes to help it prevent disease. And why is this so important? We're, we're, it's all ties back to food. So if you look at this, so why, so why are we talking about this? So we, we study this in rheumatoid arthritis already. It's in our journals. And they've talked about this. They've looked at different drugs that can help this. Of course, there's no drugs that can help this right now. But food, we're talking about food. Here's a chart of different foods phytonutrients and fruits and vegetables that are natural histone deacetylase inhibitors. We want to inhibit histone deacetylase, which can help our epigenetics. So garlic, cruciferous vegetables, turmeric, soy, bitter melon, all these things are so good for you. Keep eating them, eat the rainbow. We're going back to the same theme here. Let's talk about fasting next. I love fasting. That's why we met at the Fasting Escape Chef, AJ. Uh, because I love fasting. It helps autoimmune disease. And fasting can be hard for people. That's why people say, no, thank you. I'm fasting. So Ningen Journal of Medicine last year talked about the effects of intermittent fasting on health, aging, and disease. And I'm talking about it because I'm talking about autoimmune disease. And what it, what it does when you fast, okay, it, it, up, it downregulates something called mTOR. mTOR can be upregulated in inflammation. So this is a molecule. This is a pathway that a fasting affects. This is the main pathway. So when you're fasting also, it increases beta hydroxybutyrate. So when you have type one diabetes, you do not want to be fasting because it increases beta hydroxybutyrate. And when you have that type one diabetes, you can increase your beta hydroxybutyrate and potentially cause diabetic ketoacidosis, which will send you straight to the ICU. So you don't want to do that when you have type one diabetes. So you don't want to fast, but when you have other conditions, fasting can be beneficial. So the building blocks through mTOR. So what increases mTOR? I'm going to rehash this. mTOR increases inflammation. We need mTOR in the body. Okay. But when you have too much of it, it's not good. So Amino acids come from proteins, glucose come from carbohydrates or refined sugars, and it upregulates mTOR, and mTOR can um, upregulate inflammation. But you also need mTOR to help build the body up. So it's not something that's bad for you, but when it's out of balance, it's bad. So how do you block mTOR? Um, so fasting can do it. And when mTOR is too much, like I said earlier, it increases your pro-inflammatory T cells, and it blocks your anti-inflammatory T-cells. So t toy cells is a theme here. We want this to be high because when it's high, it can tell your um, body to stop fighting infections when it needs to. It can also tell your body to stop fighting itself, to stop causing autoimmune disease. We want that to be high here and mTOR blocks that. So this has been studied in different autoimmune diseases and rheumatology, psoriatic arthritis. Intermittent fasting has been studied. It's helped psoriatic arthritis. Also, a rheumatoid arthritis is a study from fasting to a vegetarian diet. This, this study also helped rheumatoid arthritis patients as well. So fasting and intermittent fasting can be pretty effective. It's not um, the solution because the solution is your lifestyle and what you eat, but it can be a jump start to helping you. So in summary, autoimmune disease is a very complicated topic. It's, it's created partly from genetics and partly from your environment. Nutrition plays an important role for autoimmune disease and the gut microbiome is tied directly to your immune system. Fasting can help and can decrease inflammation. It's important to eat a plant-predominant diet for an anti-inflammatory diet. And a great option is a whole food plant-based diet. I'm a big advocate for a whole food plant-based diet because you're eating all the anti-inflammatory foods all the time. You're not really introducing pro-inflammatory foods. So future discussions we can talk about that weren't touched on this session lifestyle factors of sleep, stress, exercise, environmental toxins. 
um, infections and trauma as well, childhood trauma of bullying. But there's other things that can help you that we don't talk about in lifestyle medicine. That's why integrated medicine can be so helpful. This is the other part. This is what I'm studying also because I'm trying to tie everything. Acupuncture, Tai Chi, traditional Chinese medicine, Reiki, aromatherapy, deep breathing, mind-body medicine, Ayurveda, botanical medicine. These things in balance with allopathic medicine can be so helpful. Another thing I'm studying in functional medicine right now, functional medicine, some people say it's pseudoscience. Some people say it's helpful. Lifestyle medicine is a core component of functional medicine. There's value to all these different types of uh, fields. You just have to tease out what's important, what's not, and what's real, and what's evidence of it. So that's the basis of my clinic and my foundation as a doctor. I'm located in Newport Beach. My website is drlifestyle.org. I see patients all over the USA and internationally. Just reach out to me. My social media is my honoring MD on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. I dance on TikTok. So thank you very much, Chef AJ. And that's my talk. Wow, that was amazing. That they're just, you know, one of the things I hear about a lot from people is uh, Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. Is that something you deal with a lot? Is that an autoimmune condition as well? Yeah, that's an autoimmune disease of the thyroid. I, that goes to endocrinologists. I don't treat that in my clinic. But as I go through my integrative medicine training, um, I'll probably start treating that as well because you can use um, the theme that in my clinic is the same theme for thyroid disease. And also there's certain herbs and supplements that can help that as well. And that's something I'm learning in integrative medicine. In the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, you don't lurk about herbs and supplements. And these can be very helpful. And, and through my second fellowship at University of Arizona, I'm learning what are the side effects of supplements and herbs and how to um, balance that out with medication, and how to interact with medications. Because one of the things, because you mentioned fasting and one of the people that we have on the show quite frequently, Dr. Goldhammer says that for people with that to avoid gluten, that there seems to be some link with gluten. Yeah. So that's, that's a great talk. Um, that's a great uh, subject as well. So gluten is something that's not recognized by rheumatologists as something causing at least rheumatic disease. But there's data for that. And when you study functional medicine, when you study integrative medicine, when you look at the literature, gluten does cause something called a leaky gut. Okay, I'm sure you've heard that Chef AJ as well. Um, and leaky gut does contribute to autoimmune disease. And there's Dr. Fasano at Harvard. He's, he studied, um, and he's produced a lot of literature on gluten and the leaky gut. So gluten, it's a, it's a double-edged sword here because the people that live the longest in the world that are the healthiest are in gluten. So I don't tell all, all my patients to avoid gluten because I put patients to remission even in gluten. So I think it's very patient dependent. When you eat your wheat, uh, when you eat certain carbohydrates, your um, complex carbohydrates, the healthiest foods that we eat, they have gluten in it and people generally do fine, but certain people can't tolerate it. So that's where elimination diet and individual um, medicine comes into play. Right. So many people are saying what an incredible presentation. And I, I was especially interested in the part you did. Unfortunately, we're done with the interviews this year for the Truth About Weight Loss Summit, but the part about the, the link between obesity or being overweight and autoimmune disease, because it seems to be linked to just about every disease. And, mm -hmm. and yet as hard as it is to lose weight, it, if, if that's what's going to take to get rid of your autoimmune disease, it, I think it would be worth it because people with autoimmune disease suffer terribly. Oh yeah. So obesity, when I see an obese patient that is not eating right, the first thing I tell them is you got to lose weight. If you don't lose weight, I can't take you off your medications. You're going to flare frequently. So weight loss is the number one thing. It's inflammation is the foundation to almost all diseases that we have. Cancer, autoimmune disease, um, heart disease, it's all inflammation. So if you decrease the obesity though, and you increase weight loss, I mean, decrease obesity and increase weight loss, you're giving yourself a chance to get off medications. So myself, I have put patients to remission on a plant-based diet and um, we've kept my patients there, even off medications. I know there are different um, patients out there that have done it themselves as well through different diets out there, but whole food plant-based diet is the foundation of my practice. And then we go from there because not everyone will go to remission on a plant-based diets. And there's so many um, mysteries out there right now. I'm sure you've heard the lectin of plant paradox diet from Dr. Um, Stephen Gundry. I don't believe in that. I think it's overblown. 
However, legumes can be an issue for some patients. And um, there is a study on lectins out there in 2013, which I will talk about in the future. And it does generate some inflammation at the gut, but this is one study out there. There needs to be more studies out there. Um, lectins, when you soak it, you kill off the lectins. So lectins is not a huge issue. I think it comes down to individualized physiologies. And when you have autoimmune disease, your gut is already out of balance. That's why some people can't tolerate the legumes, the beans. And that's why some people can't eat a fully whole food plant beside because their gut is already an issue already, but most people can tolerate and get better. That's wonderful. I'm so happy that you're doing that. So Dora says, what about alopecia areata? Yeah, so alopecia areata is, uh, can be an autoimmune disease affecting the hair. I have only seen it once in when I did my pediatric rheumatology training at Rowan University. I'm not an expert in it, but because I'm learning integrated medicine, I am going to be learning about different supplements and herbs that can help that. So if you follow me on social media, I can give you more information in the next year. And I'll probably be seeing patients with alopecia areata in my clinic because usually these patients go to a dermatologist. And once they, if they don't get better by dermatologist, they go to rheumatologist. So I'm one of the doctors that do treat it, but I haven't treated my clinic yet. Cool. Um, people are asking about nightshades. Is that something you ever deal with telling people yeah. not to eat them? Yeah, so that's a great uh, talk as well. So nightshades is, there's no scientific evidence right now that nightshades affects autoimmune disease and arthritis. Some people, I do believe it can be an issue for some people because I do see patients coming in saying, oh doc, I eat tom-. So nightshades are a group of vegetables that um, are, includes eggplants, um, tomatoes, potatoes, bell peppers, and I think some chili peppers as well. Um, and they have a certain component of them that cause issues for certain patients. But there's clearly no scientific evidence of this. I tell my patients, if you do notice an issue of it, avoid it. But I tell them, make sure you're not eating oil, salt, or any other foods when you're eating nightshades. Because if you're eating those foods, those are inflammatory foods. So it might not be necessarily those nightshades that are causing you an issue. Uh, so it's very rare. Um, and I don't tell my patients to avoid it unless we have gone to a whole food plant-based diet already and they're still having issues. Then we start teasing out the individual um, in physio- physiological um, problems of food. Yeah. You know, your talk was so good. I got a bunch of donations today. So I need to, oh, thank, yeah. I, yeah, I th- I need to thank Queen of Aries. <laughs> Leslie, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for you know, having we, me. Well, no, it's been my pleasure. I mean, how long would you like to go? Because, you know, whenever we have a doctor, there's like a lot of questions. Some of these people probably would benefit from consults if they have the disease themselves. But this is just a general question from Kat. What came first, the obesity or the autoimmune disease? Yeah, so everybody's different. You you can be skinny and have autoimmune disease. I have patients that are underweight or normal weight that get autoimmune disease. So that's always a a great question. You know, um, when when you talk about the gut microbiome, when the gut is out of balance, gut dysbiosis, that's... The, the questions that us doctors are always asking in rheumatology, what came first, the gut dysbiosis or the autoimmune disease? And right now we don't know. I believe it's both because there's studies coming out now that um, because you have genetic markers that are at risk for autoimmune disease, like ankylosing spondylitis, your gut is already out of balance. And I think it plays a little role in genetics and your unhealthy lifestyle just makes it worse. And so I think it's both, it depends on the individual. So when you are getting a, uh, going overweight already, your gut is already getting out of balance. And then uh, autoimmune is a risk factor already, but you cannot have autoimmune disease if you don't have the genetic risk factors. That's why not everyone in the world has autoimmune disease because they don't have their genetic risk for it. Right. Okay. So maybe the genetics loads the gun, but, but having the lifestyle condition of obesity might pull the trigger for something. Exactly. I, I think Dr. Dean Ornish came up with that or Dr. S.S.C. I forgot which uh, doctor came up with that quote, but yes, genetics, I always said genetics loads a gun and uh, lifestyle of food uh, pulls a trigger. Nice. So there's a question from Jay. Do you see patients with Raynaud disease? I do. So Raynaud's is a disease that I do see in my clinic. Uh, Raynaud's is basically the fingers turn white, blue, red. Um, and basically an autoimmune, so when you, do, you can get primary Raynaud's, which is not an autoimmune disease where your vessel spasm in the cold, it can be in the cold and basically it turns blue. But when you have an autoimmune disease, you're, there's inflammation at the vessels that cause Raynaud's. And Raynaud's disease can be a risk factor. It can be a symptom of different autoimmune diseases as well. It can occur by itself, 
or it can be from vasculitis, it can be from lupus or something else or a systemic sclerosis. Great. Sorry, I'm typing, answering the chat, asking people about um, to keep it on topic with autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So there's so many. What, what can I tell you? I, I can go another 15 minutes. Okay, great. All right, let's see. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, this one is like, I don't want to get to this, the, you know, we've got questions about vaccine and that's all, that's like a dangerous territory to try I, to I, 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 I covered the, the COVID vaccine. I covered that in my uh, Facebook. Um, I, I can cover that. I, I, I give a pretty objective viewpoint of it. Yeah. Cause, cause, cause Kay says, what do you think of the COVID vaccine as a rheumatologist and a rheumatology patient? I yeah. also have spun, that's sp you know, that, arthritis. That's such a hard <laughs> word to say managed with a sugar oil salt free diet, but I am nervous about getting the vaccine at this stage. So that's a, yeah, that's an excellent question. So let me just say this. Um, I'll be talking about this on my social media as well. So vaccines can give autoimmune disease. It's known in the literature, but it's very rare. So th that's an objective viewpoint. Okay. I'm not going to get into politics or anything like that. So general vaccines can give autoimmune diseases, whether it's your hepatitis vaccine, your um, HPV vaccine, it's, uh, it's rare, but it's been proven and it's called the Asia syndrome. I'll be talking about that as well. Um, but in general, in the American College of Rheumatology, we recommend vaccinations for our patients because that is so rare. As far as the COVID vaccine is concerned, the, there has been no studies that have been done on autoimmune patients getting the COVID vaccine. The COVID vaccine studies from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were done on patients that had heart disease, diabetes, um, or healthy, uh, but they were not done in autoimmune disease patients or patients that were um, taking like injection medications for autoimmune disease. So we don't have studies for that. So I can't say what will happen, but in general, if you look back at the previous vaccines, um, patients did okay on them. I myself being an autoimmune disease patients have gotten the first shot uh, three weeks ago. I'm getting my second shot and uh, tomorrow. And after my first shot, I just had some shoulder soreness and I did fine. Um, I'm kind of worried about the second shot because that's where you get a little bit more symptoms, um, some fever, some chills, um, some headaches, but that's expected because your body's ex generating an immune response. You want an immune response. Um, so I would say in general, it's up to you, you and your rheumatologist. There is no right or wrong answer here. When you get COVID, you can also get autoimmune disease. And when you get COVID, you can flare. Viruses can cause autoimmune disease, whether you're talking about EBV, CMV, or you're talking about herpes virus, um, hepatitis, and COVID. I saw a patient in my clinic having, she got COVID, and then she ended up getting arthritis right after that. So now I have to treat her for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you can get lupus from uh, viruses. So because, so it's a double-edged sword here. If you don't want the vaccine, you're at risk of getting COVID. And when you get COVID, you can flare. It can make your autoimmune disease worse, or you can get a new autoimmune disease. When you get a vaccine, I think you're much less likely to get an autoimmune disease. And when you get the vaccine, you are much less likely to flare as well. Um, but it's not 100% bulletproof, either one. So you got to make an um, informed decision and a discussion with your doctor. Great. Thank you. So a lot of people like Colleen are asking about vitiligo and sorry, Dupitren. I'm not terrible yeah, at pronouncing yeah, words. Yeah, and, and can a whole food plant-based diet help? I have not seen it help. I have not seen too many of these. I mean, I've seen vitiligo in my clinic, but these patients usually have something else going on. They have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. And vitiligo is a uh, a, more of an autoimmune disease. Uh, that is seen by dermatologists. So I really don't see it by itself in my clinic. And I have not seen it improve from a whole food plant-based diet, but I, that's not to say it's not possible. And for Dupitrans contracture, that's more of um, your skin is thickened in the, the fascia, the connective is thickened in the hand. And I personally have not seen it improve in my clinic either. Um, but everybody's different. Just because you have one autumn disease doesn't mean the other person with autumn disease cannot get better everybody's different because you, it's not only diet that is a role here. You get, you have to understand um, that the environmental toxins is important. How, how are your stress levels? Are you exercising and how strong are your genes? If your genes are so strong that sometimes diet doesn't help it as much as the person next to you. So that's why some people get autoimmune, some people don't. And it's all the genes that are passed down from 
your grandma, your great grandmother. That's why the food you eat today will affect many generations to come because of the epigenetics. There was a, um, I don't know if you read the book, Eat to Beat Disease by Dr. William Lee. Uh, so there was a study in there, or was that in Dr. Greger's book? I forgot which one, but there was a study on rats and they put uh, a set of rats on a whole food plant based on a high fiber diet. And they put the other set of rats on a, on a high uh, fat diet, like a keto diet. And they found that after nine generations of rats, the rats with the, on the high fat diet last, lost all the good bacteria. So your, the way you live will affect your offspring and your future generations to come. So that's why I keep eating a whole food plant-based diet. Right. Because even, even if somebody had an autoimmune disease that couldn't be helped by eating a whole food plant-based diet, it's still going to prevent heart disease and all the other things that could happen to you. So there's no reason not to do it, even if it didn't help with one little thing. Yeah. I mean, because, because like people, you know, I, I get, I get, you know, when you're on social media, you get these people and like the right things like, cause you know, I was born with asthma. I, I mean, everybody smoked in my house till I was 18. Yeah. There were three smokers. Come on. So, you know, I have allergic asthma, but I don't take medicine. I'm fine. And people will write like, well, you know, if the whole food plant-based diet worked, you wouldn't have had this. That's not, that doesn't mean, yeah. that, you know, it, it's it Exactly, Chef AJ. It, it's it's really a balance. You can you can have a you can have a very clean household that never smoke. You still get asthma because there's things in the environment. There's pollution. Pollution increases the risk of rheumatoid arthritis. We know that. And there's a new study that came out from patients, uh, the people in the military, when they were burning th- when they're exposed to burning pits and when they're burning things, they also uh, have more rheumatoid arthritis. If you're abused when you're younger, if you were childhood uh, bullying. Um, the studies have shown that you have more risk for rheumatoid arthritis as well. So it's just not about eating right. Eating right will decrease the risk of different diseases, but it will not eliminate it for everybody. Everybody's different. Right. So because uh, Tensha said uh, she was newly diagnosed with RA, will the diet help? I mean, it's certainly worth a try because it's free. Yeah. So yeah. So it's, I, I would recommend you di- try a whole food plant-based diet. If it doesn't work, then you have to at least work with a whole food plant-based doctor so they can get you on the right track and they can play around with your diet. Because I have patients, you know, whole food plant-based diet may not work 100% of the time. Like it may not put them to resolution. And then, But there's supplements, there's medications. Yeah. And but, then there, but even if the whole food plant-based diet didn't work for a specific disease, it's not like going on keto or the standard American exactly. diet is going to no. help. No, it's yeah, only make it worse. Yeah, no, never go on the keto diet. Don't go on a carnivore diet because these things will negatively affect your gut microbiome. And your gut microbiome is so important. All, there, there was a new study that came out from a keto, a patient on a keto diet, their gut microbiome was uh, severely um, uh, affected in a, a detrimental way because of the high fat diet. So even if, I, okay, so I have, I've had patients who come to me saying, they, they want to keep that they got better, right? But I'm thinking long term. So, so you've 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 probably heard of stories where oh people say I have type two diabetes, I'm on a keto diet, and I got better. But what does um, PCRM say? What do a lot of doctors say? You have to look at the long term data. Just because you get better a little bit better from a keto diet doesn't mean long term you're not going to get worse again. You're, you're you're setting yourself for heart disease. You're setting yourself for for diabetes and all these different things. One of the reasons why. Uh, some people get better on a keto diet short term is because you're eliminating processed food. Processed food is the number one contributor to autoimmune disease. You're eliminating refined sugar. You're eliminating maybe dairy. Um, you're eliminating, um, what is it? Uh, chips, cookies, all these things. And some people, that's all they need to eliminate and they get better. But because they, they go straight to a keto diet, they think the keto diet was the main thing. Or a paleo diet, they think because I now went to a paleo diet, I got better. But maybe if you eliminate just processed food, you would have gotten better already. So, um, so it's not just like a keto diet is the answer or paleo diet. That's not it. Um, and that's where people get it wrong. Absolutely. It's never the answer. Parker asks, why do people with Shogun's have trouble swallowing and does it affect the kidney and the liver? Yeah. So Shogun's is a systemic autoimmune disease, just like all the other autoimmune diseases I treat. And by systemic, I mean, it affects different organs in the body. So Sjogren's is an autoimmune disease that attacks the, um, that can attack the salivary glands, the mucosal glands, it attacks the lacrimal glands of the eyes where you have trouble tearing, you have trouble um, producing saliva and saliva is so important to uh, keep your teeth healthy. That's what I recommend if you have Sjogren's to see your dentist frequently. And people have trouble swallowing because you're not drinking saliva. And sometimes that can affect the swallowing as well. Shogans can also affect the lungs. You can have trouble breathing. It can cause inflammation in the lungs. It can give you arthritis and give you um, 
uh, rashes as well. So Sjogren's, it's typically it's known as dry eyes, dry mouth, but it affects so much more. Nice. This is a, a, actually a really good question. Not that other ones weren't really good, but I like this question from Deborah, which is how do we know if we are really in remission? If we are feeling good, can we really not be developing the joint damage? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, a study just came out, I think in the past six months, uh, I think it was on rheumatoid arthritis. And just because a patient does not have any clinical symptoms does not mean their bone is not being chipped away. Um, so there was a study on this. I don't remember the detail of the study, but I remember the conclusion. And basically the patients, um, they looked at patients that were in remission and some of them were still having um, radiographic um, damage still, even though they were in remission. So that's why I always tell my patients, even though you are in remission, you don't have any joint stiffness, you don't have any joint pain, you still have to go see your rheumatologist or your doctor every so often, at least every three months, because you can have something in the labs that's brewing or you, your x-rays can be showing disease still. So you wanna work very closely. So there's some people that say they're in remission and they don't ever see their doctor again. I think that's very dangerous because there's disease such as lupus where you have to get labs and you can only, sometimes you can only tell from labs where their lupus is active. Wow, neat. So when you mentioned salt before, people were asking, well, what about things like miso and soy sauce and coconut aminos and those kind of things? Yeah, so I would say salt in excess is very inflammatory. Everybody's different. Some people have to cut out salt completely. Some people can eat a little bit of salt. So everybody's different. Um, I notice when I eat a lot of salt, it's very bad for me. So even if I'm eating ve vegetarian sushi, I don't eat the, I don't touch the salt, uh, the soy sauce. Soy sauce is a very processed, okay? Um, I would say even sea salt, Himalayan salt, um, I try to avoid. I just try to cook without salt as much as I can. Because once you cook bland, your taste buds will adapt to that kind of cooking. Um, I, once you cook bland, everything tastes grand. Exactly. If people oh, okay. just yeah. knew, if people would just get over themselves and the hump and just do what Dr. Goldhammer says, eat SOS free. Every meal is like delicious. You can actually, it's like if you've smoked your whole life, you can't taste food. You know, it's funny because I, I used to work with a couple of chefs, different jobs, different restaurants, but only two actually smoked. And they had the worst tasting food because they couldn't taste because their taste buds were literally being burned every day. And their food was just not very good. They used too much pepper because they couldn't taste their food. And it's like when you use salt, you can't taste what food tastes like. And until you stop that addiction, you don't know how good food really tastes. Exactly. That's why when people, they are, they're omnivores and they go home for time beside, they, they don't, they, they, they have a hard time adjusting because they're not used to eating that. That's why I love fasting because when you fast, like for 24 hours, your taste buds start adapting. So even um, something that doesn't taste that tasty, you can taste all the nutrients in it. You can taste all the flavor because your taste buds have reset after fasting. Um, so I would say everybody's different. You, some people can tolerate some cocoa and amino, some soy sauce, but in general, I avoid as much as I can. You know, my feeling is, is if you are eating good food, you don't need to adulterate it with sugar, oil, and salt. Exactly. The, the thing is, is it's such an addiction that people just, they can't stop. And I get yeah. it because for some people it can take just a couple days. Some people can take a couple months, but once you're there, because the thing is, is, you know, people that don't eat the salt, like Dr. Verman, Dr. Greger, Dr. Goldhammer, and they, you know, Dr. Goldhammer for 40 years, we wouldn't be eating this way if it was a punishment. It, it, the food tastes better, but until they, you know, I'm, a, I'm very passionate about this. Can you yeah, tell? Because, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I'm on the same way as I think you, I, I say, try go SOS as much as you can. Um, and then, you know, we, I always go back to the theme, try to eat the way we did thousands of years ago. They had this ate from the natural tree, from the floor. Um, the, people didn't really add all these refined things into their food back then. Okay. Well, I know you have to go in a minute. So just one more question, because people keep asking, is fibromyalgia an autoimmune disease? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, fibromyalgia is not an autoimmune disease. Um, it's, a, this, it's a disease where you're hypersensitive to pain, where, and you can get other symptoms such as um, brain fog and all these different things. But it's a disease that is your central nervous system. The pain receptors are hyperactive for whatever reason. I don't think we have the complete answers right now. It, you know, research needs to go into it. But conclusively, we can say that right now, as the research shows, it's not an autoimmune disease. But I can't say that in 20 years, it won't change. Um, but across the board, across all rheumatologists, we know it's not an autoimmune disease. And we, th the reason why I say that is because we 
traditionally we treat patients with antidepressant medications with fibromyalgia, um, like um, gabapentin, duloxetine, and Lyrica. And patients do get better from just antidepressant medications or just pain medicine or sleeping right or exercise does help with fibromyalgia. So um, there's other ways to treat fibromyalgia. Whole food plant-based diet is definitely helpful as well because your gut microbiome is out of balance as well in fibromyalgia. So I treat fibromyalgia differently than a typical rheumatologist and, my, and I treat disease differently than a typical rheumatologist because your typical rheumatologist and your typical doctor, you'll go to their clinic and you'll basically talk to them and they'll tell you your diagnosis, your symptoms, and they give you a treatment and bye-bye, you're out the door. But that's not the way I practice. That's not the way my wife practices in our clinic. My wife is a primary care doctor. She's lifestyle medicine trained. And we go over your whole spectrum your diagnosis, your nutrition, your stress, your exercise, and um, and integrative medicine. I talk, we talk about that as well. Mind body medicine, acupuncture, all these different things. And um, I know you recently had Dr. Dysinger on your show. He's a good friend of mine. Um, oh, yeah, nice. yeah oh, we, he's the best. Oh, yeah, wow. he's awesome. Yeah, we talked together. Um, we had dinners together back at Loma Linda. Um, he's another great resource, and that's not the way these lifestyle medicine doctors, like me and my wife and Dr. Dysinger, treat patients. You know. We have, and in our model at Dr. Lifestyle, we, we are out of the insurance model because we, we want to give our patients time and patients can contact us after hours as well. And we, we come to our client, it's a relaxed visit. And especially with my wife's model for primary care, she spends an hour, two hours on visits with patients. So you get a complete care. So it's very different than your average doctor. Wow. I know I said one more question, but I, we have an, Go ahead. Emergency. No. we have, we have a physician watching. I, I still have time. Okay, good. Well, we have a, we have a physician watching who is an emergency room physician who's going to be board certified in lifestyle medicine. Dr. Marino wants to know what is the autoimmune protocol diet? Yeah. So the autoimmune protocol diet, I think that was developed by um, multiple sclerosis patients. Um, I think there was one, there's something called the walls protocol. That's very similar. Um, and this patient had multiple sclerosis who um, basically put her disease to remission on a paleo diet. So that's what the autoimmune protocol diet, it's a paleo diet. So that's why the paleo diet is so popular because some people do get better on the paleo diet. Um, but you know, the whole food plant-based diet can also put multiple sclerosis and autoimmune disease patients to remission. I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Sarai Stanchik. She's a good friend of mine as well. Well, she's going to be on the show Tuesday oh, talking yeah. about her new book and Brooke Goldner, I think next Friday talking awesome. about it. Uh, oh, see, Goldner. I got you guys covered. Whatever the disease, I'm getting you somebody to awesome. talk about. Awesome. Yeah. Brooke Goldner is another great resource. Um, so Dr. Sarai Stanchik is an uh, infectious disease doctor um, who won a whole food plant-based diet and put her multiple sclerosis to remission. Um, so there's different ways to go about it, but the, in general, the healthiest, the, okay, so, my, so the pale diet, does work for autoimmune disease. I'm not going to deny that because um, there are a lot of patients that claim that have happened and a lot of doctors that do that, but it's not the answer. The reason why I say this is the way reason why I say the whole food plant-based diet is you have to try that first. That's the key answer is we have to go back to the foundation. We have to go back to the blue zones and people that live the longest. Who are the healthiest people in the world? You know, these patients are eating a plant predominant diet. They're eating grains. They're eating a lot of fiber. And you want to tend towards that. You don't want to go to paleo diet because you're cutting out a lot of grains and grains have a lot of fiber and it's the healthiest. And you want to live the longest too, because just because you put an autoimmune disease to remission doesn't mean that you can't develop other diseases. You can also, patients with autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, they have a higher risk of getting heart disease. Lupus patients have a 50% higher, 50 times higher risk of getting a, a heart attack than your average person. And what are they eating on paleo that they're eating? A lot of meats, a lot of chicken, and a lot of um, other meat products. And that's why you don't want to go on a paleo diet, okay? When you go on paleo, you can go on remission, but you're, eat, you're cutting out processed food. And But that's what a whole food plant-based diet does. You cut out dairy too. That's what a whole food plant-based diet does. But you're cutting out a lot of fiber. So if, I do not recommend a paleo diet. Always go to a whole food plant-based diet. Thank you. I promise this is the last question. This is a fun one because <laughs> everybody one. wants to know every guest, what does Dr. You eat in a day? Yeah. So I, I love eating oatmeal uh, with blueberries or just uh, berries in the morning. I love eating um, smoothies in the morning as well. Um, I love putting kale, um, spinach and whatever frozen fruits and vegetables. I, have. I like adding flax seeds, turmeric powder into my smoothies. And I like chia seeds to it as well. Um, I can't eat too, I can't put too many vegetables. I have to balance out fruits or else it gets too bitter for me. Um, I eat my wife's cooking also. So, um, my, my wife, uh, Dr. Mandala, she, 
likes to cook with tempeh. Um, we do some Asian cooking as well. So, I mean, my parents eat out a lot. So I don't live with my parents, but when I eat with them, um, there's a, eating out, there's a lot of oil in it. So I tell them, try to decrease the oil, salt in my foods. But there's so many good foods in Asian cooking. There's um, bok choy. We eat uh, mushrooms, black mushrooms, anoki mushrooms. Um, I know you talked about miso. So I do eat miso soup as well. Um, even though I salt, I do okay with it. Organic tofu, edamame. Um, I mentioned tempeh already. So there's just a lot of different foods out there that you can eat on a whole food plant-based diet, even though it's Asian. There's a, I think there's not too many Asian whole food plant-based doctors out there. And oh, wait, do you know Dr. Colin Zhu? I do. Yes, he's a good friend of mine. We met. Well, many oh my times. God, you guys should go into practice. It could be Zoo and you, or you and Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I because, haven't thought of that. Because he's a chef. He, he's a, he's one of the guests on the summit. He actually did a cooking demo. Yes, yes, yes. So, so yeah, he's he's one of kind. There's not too many chef doctors out there. Um, so he's great. I think he has a summit coming up too as well. But um, yeah, there's so many good um, cooking Asian vegetables out there and Asian fruits. You have bok choy, you have Chinese broccoli. You, if you go to an Asian grocery store, there's a whole aisle of just Asian vegetables out there. Um, and also you have Asian fruits, dragon fruit, mangosteen, things you can't get in America, like mangosteen um, is so good. I always go to Asia, I always eat that. And lychee, you can get it here, but it's always tastier in Asia when you get it from the source. So there's so much good food out there. When you just have to explore different cultures and there's so much variety. What did you grow up eating? Uh oh, can't hear me now. This happened the other day with Dr. McDougall. Oh my, this is so weird. I bet you guys can hear me. Can you guys hear me, but not him? Is that correct? Wait, I don't one think... second. Oh, now I can hear you again. Do you know what just happened? I'm back. I'm back. Do, you, do you know what just happened? Because that my... happened. The... Oh, I'm a Bluetooth and it turned off because we were on too long. <laughs> I'm so, so, you know, because this happened the other day with, the, well, this is a sign from the universe. We need to stop. I was just curious what you grew up eating, if it was different. Oh yeah. No, I grew up with the standard American diet. Um, so I would eat fried food all the time. You know, the, the Asian um, diet, it's, you know, back then traditionally it was very healthy. Um, like Dr. Campbell, his book, like the China study back then, people um, in China ate a very, very healthy diet. But until uh, the standard American diet came along, um, and like this, I started eating a standard American diet. Um, I grew up in America. I was born in California. So I grew up eating McDonald's, uh, fast foods, um, frozen foods, uh, popcorn chicken, uh, pizza bites, uh, lean cuisine. And even in, when we ate out with Asian food, it was always very processed, oily, fried um, a lot of fried um, uh, lobster, beef and broccoli, you know, all, all the all the stuff that is pro-inflammatory, I ate it and it eventually caught up to me when I went on my high protein diet. Wow. Well, I'm glad that I'm glad that you're eating well, looking well and feeling well now. Oh, and so uh, just tell people not to be afraid of rice. I eat rice and I eat white rice and I'm not ashamed to admit it. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah, no, I tell patients, you know, eat rice. You got to eat carbohydrates. Those who find carbohydrates so healthy for you. And you lose weight naturally. I lost 30. I know you had your own weight loss uh, story too, Chef Aze. I've seen your before and after pictures. It's amazing. But I also, I've lost 30 pounds. Um, I lost 25 pounds in the past. In one year, I lost 25 pounds or a year or two. So I feel, I weigh less than I did in middle school. So I feel the best ever. Yeah, and I weigh less than I did in high school. It's amazing. It's yeah. Amazing. And, and I, every time people bash white rice, I'm like, well, yeah, talk to Dr. Walter Kempner. He reversed diabetes with it. So yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, I'm sorry. I, you know, it's just, you're so fun to talk to and you're such a wealth of knowledge. Oh, you're we'll so fun to, too. We'll I love have your to show. Have you back. We have to have you back someday. Maybe have you back with your wife. That might be kind of a fun show doing you both together, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. And then maybe we could talk about, uh, yeah, we talk whatever we want to talk about. And then in the future, I can talk about my integrative medicine because there's so many ways to treat autoimmune disease. Um, not just food yeah. there's maybe you stress. guys could even make a recipe together in your kitchen it'd be fun we'll do a show with the whole family oh yes we can do that even with our dog <laughs> yeah no i love the dogs are always welcome anyway i know i kept you way too long but thank you so much this was just oh. a wonderful presentation oh yeah thank you so much Chef i think what you're doing is um, so healing for the world there's nothing really out there like what you're doing and oh. being as a chef you're coming from a different perspective and being a patient yourself um so thank you so much for inspiring all of us and um and if you, if you guys aren't following me, just follow me on my social media. I talk about science a lot and hopefully Pepe's diet and autoimmune disease.
Right. Absolutely. Well, I feel like I want to be Don King, but for vegans, I want to promote all the great people that are doing great work like you well, so that you. one day I can just retire. And I also want to thank all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have two shows. The first show in the both cooking demos is Maggie Neola. She is a registered dietitian at PCRM. And then at two o'clock, Jill Dalton's going to be making gluten-free bread from her brand new book. Thanks again, Dr. Yu. You were thank fantastic. You. Thank you, Chef